Okay, welcome back after the short break. <laughs> so the next uh, speaker, it's uh, it's all right. I added you as well. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. I'm second Perfect. author on this talk. Okay, so our but, next, yeah. I was going to say second author on this talk, but but first author of of the idea of using S two and R. Yeah, I caused okay. a lot of this, yes. Okay, yeah. so he kind of deserved being here, right, <laughs> in the stream. Yeah. Okay, so our next uh, uh, speaker is Donny, no, Dewey Donington. Uh, he's an environmental researcher, programmer, and educator, educator based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, Dewey's research investigates the mechanisms that control metal cycling in lakes alongside geospatial applications to environmental research. He is currently a physical scientist at Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. Okay, so I will add your presentation. Now the floor is yours, Dewey. Uh, great, thank you so much. And uh, I'm really excited to present this talk. Uh, I'm really also uh, excited to present this talk alongside Edzer, who, as he said, caused all of this. Um, and uh, we'll hear from Edzer in a bit about uh, some of the, uh, the challenges that we've had uh, implementing all of this stuff. Um, and so the title of the talk is uh, Open Source Geometry on the Sphere. And uh, I, I wanted to, I, uh, it was noted in my introduction there that I have some geospatial applications uh, to environmental research. And this is like as hard as it goes into the nerd category. Uh, and I love it. Uh, it's great. Um, I'm also really fortunate to work uh, on this uh, alongside the Fisheries and Oceans Canada, who I work for. Um, I work in the uh, Ocean uh, Arctic Stressors and Ocean Science, uh, sorry, Ocean Stressors and Arctic Science Division. And uh, the ocean obviously can, encompasses the poles and the ocean uh, does not inconveniently stop, does not conveniently stop at the uh, negative 180 uh, uh, longitude line. So this has uh, been really uh, impactful on the work that we do, uh, trying to map the oceans and do analysis on the oceans. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight that. And I kind of wanted to start with a couple of, uh, you know, just a couple of hypotheticals. You know, maybe your data is is in longitude and latitude, and like a, a lot of data comes to you in a spreadsheet, and you you don't really know necessarily what kind of longitude it means. Perhaps. The people watching this talk know a bit more about that, but a lot of people who are using this kind of software don't. Uh, you have longitude and latitude in two columns, maybe in a spreadsheet or something. And uh, but the world isn't actually just just an x and a, and a y, where the the one number you plot on the x-axis and the other number uh, you, you plot on the y-axis. Um, you know, Antarctica doesn't isn't actually that shape in any projection or in any way you look at the Earth. Uh, nor is is Russia really split in two ever. Uh, right there. And so uh, the Earth is maybe more something like this, where it, it, it's round and it's difficult to look at it in any one direction uh, without making some assumptions. And uh, yeah, you know, this is there's some parts of this that make a whole lot more sense. Like Antarctica is one one polygon, and there's one point all along the edge there, and there is no point on that polygon at the South Pole. Uh, nor is there any part of of Russia that has a line straight through that negative 180 uh, degree line. Uh, and so this is perhaps uh, a better reflection of uh, analysis and certainly one whose assumptions are more suited to global analysis. And so you might also have some questions that are global. Uh, and we certainly do uh, when we're at fisheries and oceans, when we're, when we're looking at stuff in the ocean, we might wanna know, for example, uh, whether something is in a certain radius of, of, of a, a land, but in a global way. Um, and so you might be able to do something like this, uh, where it's, you can buffer it and maybe you can assume latitude and longitude at the equator is some distance. Um, but there are some things that are, that are, don't make any physical sense about this. Uh, and you know, one of them is that you you, you have things that are off of the edge of the world here. There is no, uh, longitude that is past negative 180. There is no longitude that's, you know, to the right of 180. And we have this polygon is in both of those places, uh, in a number of in a number of places. Similarly, there's no land south of negative 90. Uh, and even if uh, the wizards at the GIS, uh, your GIS wizards that are watching this, can figure out how to solve those problems, 
the distance up here really has no, no bearing on the distance down here because uh, the number of degrees is in like a diagonal degree unit and it doesn't really make any sense at all. Um, but the answer might be something more like this, uh, where you're on a sphere and you can measure the distance you know, away from all the continents and, and, and create that line using the assumption of a spherical Earth uh, rather than the assumption of a, of a flat Earth. Um, and for global problems, uh, this kind of approach is needed. Uh, the people that are, are really good at this stuff, and I know a number of them are probably watching, uh, might uh, correctly point out that the Earth isn't necessarily exactly round. Uh, but it's certainly a far better assumption than assuming that the Earth is exactly flat. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, some of those assumptions uh, later on. And another thing that we wanted to solve in a problem that comes across, up all the time is that a lot of times you, you're trying to represent some simplified version of a geometry using only four numbers. So in this case, you've got you know negative 180 and 180. And then you've got uh, uh, you know the southern boundary and of Alaska is what I'm using here, and the northern boundary of Alaska. Uh, this is not a, the simplest rectangle that you could find that encompasses Alaska, and it doesn't really have any bearing, uh, especially if you're considering that these are only four points. Like, what is this edge to this edge, or this edge to this edge, or this edge to this edge? Over what surface are you are you uh, interpolating that edge? We'll talk a bit about that later too. Um, but on the sphere, it's a little bit more complicated. A rectangle doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, and so uh, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but uh, you can use a couple of rectangles and that actually can be a very good approximation uh, and is often an excellent approximation of, of a shape. Um, now, uh, you might say, okay, but this uses more than four numbers. Um, but in the, in the indexing system that we'll talk about in a second, uh, it actually is using the exact uh, same uh, number of bytes to represent it. So it's using four numbers to represent this, uh, but each one of these uh, little rectangles, and there's four of them that are packed in there, uh, is represented by one number. And maybe there's another way to do it too. You could use three numbers. You could use some longitude and latitude that's the middle, and then you could also use some uh, radius around that. So there are global ways to, to, to simplify a geometry, but they don't make the same sense as uh, the ones that work when you're in only, only two dimensions uh, on a flat Earth. And the way that uh, we went about this, and I say we, uh, Edzer came up with the idea, uh, and, uh, and uh, Ed Rudback was the first person to implement this kind of thing in R. And uh, we use this ST geometry library, and it is an open source library. Uh, it's created and supported by Google. Um, it is also an indexing system, uh, which helps it do a lot of these things very quickly. Uh, and the R package S2 is the one that I'm presenting, and, and it's how I use made all those pretty diagrams, the spinning earth and all that. Um, and it provides a flexible set of R bindings to this library, um, but using a style that might be more familiar to R users, um, because the S2 geometry library largely is C++, it is C++, and is largely object-oriented the way that you do this stuff. Uh, which is not really how uh, our users are used to doing that. Um, and uh, as SF, as of SF version 1.0, uh, S2 is the backend that we're using uh, if you have longitude and latitude. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that and some of the uh, uh, the problems that that causes, but also some of the the, the solutions that it is able to uh, to provide. Um, so you can use the S2 library uh, directly. Um, and I, I think that uh, perhaps this is not the first way that I would uh, suggest going about using S2, I'd suggest using SF, um, but the S2 package itself provides a lot of the low level details. Um, and so perhaps a lot of spatial developers, which might be the audience for today, um, a lot of those spatial developers might actually wanna have access to those low level solutions and you can get those in S2, um, the package. So here's an example uh, where we're trying to figure out which cities are in Canada um, you can, there's an intersex predicate, just like there is in GEOS, and uh, you can figure out which one of those uh, cities intersects a polygon uh, using the spherical assumption uh, between the edges. In SF, you can do the same thing, and this is running the same code in the, in the back. Um, but this is very cool because SF has the ability to read files from, from GDAL, it has the ability to reproject things that started somewhere that might not have been. Uh, on the sphere. 
or that might've been in a different, uh, uh, different data monosphere. Uh, and so this is incredibly powerful. I used a very simple example here, but uh, there are some really powerful things that you can do with SF now that you couldn't before uh, because we were assuming uh, like much of the rest of the, the open geo stack that when you interpolate between two points on uh, latitude and latitude, uh, you're interpolating uh, a line in a space that doesn't make any sense. Uh, there's a lot of challenges with doing that. And I think that perhaps a lot of you, uh, or at least this has come up when people ask me about uh, stuff problems they've had with recent versions of SF. Um, there are definitely some, uh, you, you might've gotten this error where you found an issue with a feature that had invalid spherical geometry. And uh, and uh, this has been a really tough one uh, to solve because there, it's the, the assumption of having uh, an edge on the sphere be uh, an edge in uh, on, a, on a plane has been so long standing that uh, a lot of these data sets don't have that assumption. Um, and nor did anybody, I think, even uh, consider that that kind of assumption uh, would be present in a lot of different uh, data sets. So uh, it's something that we uncovered when we started doing these reverse dependency checks and it's uh, providing uh, solutions for that has been a large part of uh, my contribution to this while I've been working at Fisheries and Oceans. Um, there's also some things that are really slow uh, that shouldn't be. It should be said that there's also a lot of things that are really fast uh, that uh, uh, that have no right being that fast, in my opinion. It's uh, some of these problems that are incredibly complex, um, and uh, in, in many cases, it does outperform uh, the 2D uh, version of it. But there's also some really important cases where it doesn't, and one is uh, aggregating polygons that might overlap each other. Uh, and, and this has been something that uh, only recently has somebody provided a, a pathway to doing this much faster. Uh, and I'm actually really excited to dig into that uh, as we uh, move past into the next version of uh, the S2R uh, package. Um, another thing that is, uh, that is usually uh, quite fast but uh, doesn't scale particularly well right now um, is the uh, distance within. So I mentioned that problem where you have within 500 uh, kilometers of something on the sphere. And uh, that, that is actually pretty slow when you start to get a lot of points involved. And uh, so that's something that we're excited to work on. Uh, it shouldn't be that slow. Um, and so we're obviously uh, doing something wrong and uh, we like to fix that. And there's also a number of things that just don't exist yet. Um, so one of them uh, is the, the segmentize, which in uh, SF is being used as uh, using LWGM as a backend. And uh, we, it just wasn't something that was built into the S2 library and there wasn't an existing function. Um, so it's not something that, that uh, we did yet. I think Ezra will talk in a little bit about, uh, <clears throat> about uh, buffering and, and some of the challenges with that. Um, and also uh, providing a pathway to, you know, once you have these beautiful spherical clean data sets, how do you uh, export that in such a way that all the other software in the world that is making the other assumption can, can work with it? Um, and part of that is wrapping along the dateline and splitting up those uh, polar and uh, uh, polygons that cross the anti-meridian. Uh, and that, those aren't those aren't there yet, but those are things that uh, that we're excited to work on. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to pass it to Edzo now, uh, who who has some more challenges. But Edzo, you also feel free to let me uh, flip back and forth to any slides you want to talk about. I think we've got plenty of time. Sure. Uh, yes, I will. Back and forth. Yes. So uh, yeah, and I will also catch the first question from the from the discussion board because this is uh, essentially what is what is going on uh, right now. So what happened uh, is that we use this S two geometry engine really as a replacement for geos in SF the moment your data are in ellipsoidal coordinates, meaning your data are not projected. Yeah. So if you have latitude longitude coordinates. Otherwise, you would throw things in geos, which, which, which says latitude longitude is, is a plane, is R2. No, it's now throwing it into an engine, in the S2 geometry engine, which assumes it's on a sphere, yeah, which is sort of somewhat closer to the shape of the Earth, as, uh, as, as Dewey uh, rightly said. So, uh, yeah, so this is happening. Um, a number of things. So the thing, and a number, then of course you need to replace basically all the functions that you have in, in SF. And that is, the problem is that that is not entirely possible. Um, SF stands for simple features, so it has a list of simple features that are listed in the standard, but the Geos library has a lot more of things and add-ons came from the from post-GIS and so on. So there's not, let's say, a, a clear restriction. And one of the 
uh, things that is that is a, that is some difficulty is the is the sort of ST buffer function in SF, which now uses S2 buffer cells, which does a cell approximation of a buffer, which is basically what uh, what Dewey showed, which is basically a, a, a couple a, a sort of a, a, a non-smooth representation uh, of of a of a buffer that that includes the buffer, but it's slightly larger. And and if you take a lot of cells, it, it's you know you won't see that it's non-smooth. But then you need to take a lot of cells, and it takes a lot of time and memory. So um, what I think is going on that is is that that works quite well for visualizing things. Um, and uh, if you know taking enough enough cells and um, what people do a lot in analysis is that they use or that they basically abuse buffers to uh, to select things that are in a certain distance of something else because that's the way you think about it. I draw first a line around it and then I look if, if the, the thing falls into the buffer or not, uh, which is a very inefficient way of doing this also by uh, using geos, but then then it is not still relatively fast. Uh, in as to geometry, there is a function st is within distance, which is blazingly fast, which uses indexes and which is exact and fast. So what we have to do, what we have to get there is basically that users understand what they do and what they shouldn't do uh, un until somebody writes a proper buffer on the sphere. Yeah, that would be sort of a nice uh, study project for somebody looking for an, for an exercise, for a new challenge to, uh, to fix. Um, other things that sort of a lot of things that people come up. So as we said, we did all the reverse dependency tests of a couple of hundred packages depending on SF now uh, with all kinds of tests and examples and so on. And, and people report things like this used to work, doesn't work anymore, what should I do? Uh, it's uh, large bounding boxes that are now that now have a very different shape. If they're not on the equator, then they suddenly sort of follow geodesics and not sort of lines with constant if they are Sort of east-west lines. They are not. They don't follow the, um, a line of constant uh, uh, latitude anymore. So that is uh, that is something. Um, we of course we can switch using it on and off, right? So you can instruct SF to basically not use S2 and and, and put it back when you are done and so on. So it's it's not like uh, like things become impossible. It's just what is the default sort of the default action of the of the package. Um, other things we haven't sorted out really is to if you have your polygons valid on S2 so that they they sort of con they are continuous over the poles and the datelines, and you want to move back to basically the world in, in quantum GIS and so on where things should be valid in in uh, plot carré, then you still have to cut uh, the, the cut back the dateline and stretch the poles and things, and that is not also also not not trivial. There's a long list of other open issues that I collected here. Um, and an interesting question to uh, to the OSGEO and phosphor geo community is sort of when will the other sort of geo stack like quantum GIS, post GIS graphs, and so on? I don't know whether there's already some support somewhere. Um, finally, adopt spherical or ellipsoidal geometry operations because it is really time. So there's so many global data sets that people now throw into just you know Euclidean geometry, flat space uh, uh, GIS operations, which is which is insane. I mean, meteorologists, physicists, and so oceanographers will not sort of will laugh at you if you do that. So what is sort of where is the where is the GIS uh, coming there? But you know, I like to provoke I like to provoke uh, uh, people in that sense. So. So I think we, uh, you know, we are. I, I already asked the, the Python people who are very jealous on us to that we are here. They said, "No, this is this is far away <laughs> future and so on." This might, you know, we might think about it, and but it is very, very, very way down the line, and and so so they are clearly not ready yet. But they are they're typically uh, they're typically following R at some stage. And another interesting question is what's going on with the OGC simple feature standard. I don't know if any one of you has seen it, but. Um, you know, it is kind of simple features are pretty much a basis for a lot of the things that are going on in, in the software stacks. And, and if the sort of the last thing that I saw is now going for a vote and people don't, you know, don't stop it, then, oh, well, it is another discussion. But uh, it, it is, there is a, a lot of a lot of issues with the last workable standard that are clearly not solved. And, and, and these problems sort of, uh, the things that we did sort of raised a number of new issues that are clearly not addressed in the new standard that apparently people are still the only thing they do is, is the areas and distances on the sphere and that's it sort of no operations and whatever representations so um i think the next slide was for you uh dewey yeah yeah uh well i just uh, is sort of a, a bit of a joke for those of you who have imported uh, use the grc uh 
API. It, it's it's very popular and, and there's a really good reason for that. It's it's backward compatible a long way for the most part. Um, it's very easy to you to link multiple versions of GEOS. I say very easy in the sense that it's easy to link multiple versions of anything, but uh, it's certainly a lot easier than uh, doing anything with multiple versions of S2. Um, and S2 is not even a library that you can install uh, on most systems. And so uh, that, that has been a huge challenge. Um, also in the sense that uh, it's using this object-oriented uh, uh, notation to do all this stuff. It's like, uh, so we, had, we sort of had to come up with all the ways to do, okay, like how do you re-approximate uh, the GEOS version of intersection? And like, how do you uh, redo the version of GEOS intersects? Um, and so that has been, uh, uh, you know, rather difficult to do. And there's certainly, we put a lot of work into doing it. Um, and I think that it's, it's really cool that we were able to do it because it is able to raise these questions and say, okay, some of the stuff actually really is possible now. Um, and so there should be versions of it in the standard. Um, and I think that, uh, maybe I'll pop back to one of the slides just to make a point. Uh, one of the, one of the, uh, I think main things is when you have two points, two points on that sphere, interpolating what, uh, where that line goes, does it go over the edge of the earth or does it go, uh, straight in, uh, assuming all of that stuff is, is Euclidean geometry. Um, I mean, it's a pretty esoteric question, but it's really important. Uh, and being able to specify which one of those it is, I think there's just no way to do that right now. And so even if you wanted to properly uh, do some of this geometry on the sphere, you, you might not be able to specify that that, uh, that, that is the case. So uh, I'm gonna pop back into the acknowledgements. Uh, the S2 uh, maintainers and, and authors have been great in helping us solve our problems. Uh, Eric Beach was the original writer of the library and the people that we've interacted with uh, that maintain it are Jesse Rosenstock uh, to help us, especially with our, with our latest problem, uh, trying to make sure that it uh, is compiles on all the new compilers. Uh, I wanna definitely uh, rethink uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada who employ me and employed me to help work on this and keep it on, uh, on CRAN. And uh, Edzer, I know he's an author on this talk, so I don't know if he goes in the acknowledgements, but he sent me an email a couple of years ago, uh, just after I'd started writing any C++ code at all. Um, and S2 is the reason that I got good at it. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of places you can look for questions. Uh, and I posted a link to the slides on Twitter. And perhaps I'll uh, hop over to the questions and post a link to the slides there in case anybody wants to uh, have a look. Okay, Dewey and Edsel, thanks for your presentation. It's indeed provoking <laughs> to the GIS work people, uh, but super interesting. Um, I think some of the questions were already um, addressed by you, especially with this long challenge, <laughs> challenges slide. Um, but I will, I will bring some of them to you, okay? Um, Okay, so the one with one vote is, are you aware of other initiatives in the GIS world tackling this S2 problem? Define GIS world. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's put it first for GGIS yeah. world. <laughs> this is the whole, well, the whole well, thing, right? S2, S2 Geometry, the library we're using, came out of Google and is the back end of big GIS, uh, big, big query GIS is the back end of Google Earth, is the back end of Google Earth Engine, is the back end of Google Maps, and so on, right? So they started doing this. They started not with GIS ideas. They started, how can we, we, do, we do the world? How can we do this cleverly, right? So it's a different thinking. So I consider that as the GIS world, and they are, they are 10 years ahead, right, of the GIS world, if you look at it like that. And they, yeah, they shared exactly. the whole thing. They shared their, their engine. Yeah, and it's it's very cool to see. I mean, the they wrote it in such a way they wrote it in a layer below some of the stand like the simple feature standard and some of the other um, different standards that are out there. Uh, so they made it possible to implement some of the standards, but they just did it in a, in a totally different way, which I think is very cool. And it enabled them to do things that uh, that you just can't do and at speeds that you can't do, um, and in sort of current software that uses C linking and and very uh, rigid data structures. 
uh, they've got some really wild things that you can do. And uh, I think that that is awesome. It's, it, it really pushes the GIS world. To the, to the point of, are we aware of other people doing S2 stuff? Uh, the answer is sort of, uh, you know, we're aware of that there's an S2 Python package. Um, and uh, the thing that I'm not aware of, uh, and perhaps whoever asked the question can point us in that direction uh, in any venue you, you see fit. Uh, well, one thing we're not aware of is, is uh, ways to uh, bridge the gap between the standard and the implementation. So there's lots of wrappers of S2 out there. There's like an S2 Go wrapper and an S2 Ruby wrapper, I think. But um, but those wrappers are largely pretty uh, literal. They're, they're wrapping the S2 library as it exists. And what's really unique about the R package and what took a huge amount of time and effort was trying to bridge the standard. How do we implement the simple feature standard using uh, this library that was totally came out of left field? Um, and so I would love to know anybody else that has done that. and. Uh, so that we can work together on, uh, yeah, making that uh, perhaps C linkable as one of the other questions, uh, or stable mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. um, so the other question is: uh, Are all the functionalities in SF, for example, going to be translated into S two geometry, or uh, no. are they possibly? <laughs> let me let me take this. I'm planning to sort of all the functionality that's not in S two. I'm planning to remove that from SF. To make things simpler, yeah. So okay. I mean, so the I mean, other way around. I mean, yeah. This is feature creep, right? So feature think, oh, there's a nice function in in the GeoS library. Why not include it? Why not interface it, right? And the next question is then, how can I do this with S2? And then you can't because it's not there. So there is, you know, mm -hmm. there is. I, I I think we should move the other way around and, and go back to the, the simple feature standard. You know, the one as we knew it, not the new one. Um, I mean, the new one is is kind of everywhere, but. Um, and, and, and sort of uh, constrained to the important things that would be more a more useful movement. If, if somebody wants to implement all the missing things into the S2 library, then, then you know, it would be trivial to interface. It. I don't see us doing that. Yeah, uh, trivial to interface is usually me doing something, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it, is, it is very hard to do uh, in a lot of cases, but some cases it's not. Um, but also, uh, yeah, this is, I mean, S2 provides a way to uh, a system of indexing and a system of, of do, doing some of these really complicated things. There are also things like constructing a buffer. Um, there's certainly no reason that that can't be done completely outside of S2. Um, and uh, just using the same assumptions, passing those coordinates around. And I think that, uh, yeah, I think a lot of the problems that we're running into are like, how do we pass those coordinates around in a way that is understood that uh, this is valid spherical geometry. Um, and yeah, so that's, and, and also there there are like, uh, I happen to be the author of one of them, but like there is a package that wraps literally every GEOS function. So if you are in a pinch, you could do that. Uh, if you are know that you're assuming this this rectangular version of whatever you're dealing with. Um, and similarly, like you can, you could also use S2 if you know that you're only dealing with spherical stuff. Um, but SF is what you use to glue it all together. And so I think Edzer is right to restrain that to, to the, some more common operations and let some of those other operations creep into uh, other libraries that he doesn't have to, to work to maintain. <laughs> now, the other question is, would breaking S2 um, underscore CH out into a standard S2 wrapper for C be a project of interest? Shall yeah. We uh, well, I mean, I, I uh, sort of, and I'll explain the pros and as I see them uh, and the cons. The, the pros are that like uh, it means that you could use S two in in more than one context and have some sort of reproducibility around that. Like you could you could install it on a Linux. I mean, you could do this now, sort of, but uh, you could install it on a, a you know a Linux and say, okay, we'll just install S two dash dev or something, and then. Uh, install the R package, and then you know we have something that we can understand uh, that we're doing, and I think that would be that would be valuable for sure. But also, a lot of the value of S two is that it it doesn't follow that uh, it doesn't it doesn't follow that uh, 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 that idea. It, it it's really an object oriented uh, approach to doing this stuff, and it largely doesn't obey any of those rules, and that is what makes it really awesome. Uh, to work with, in my perspective, like when I've been trying to maintain some of this stuff. 
Um, so I think that there is probably some middle ground. And uh, I'll just put a little uh, pitch out there that I think that the answer, the middle ground is a common data structure. Um, and I think that perhaps Apache Arrow is one of those things that could help there. Uh, so that we're not trying to reconstruct geometric objects. We're just passing, uh, you know, understood uh, pairs of coordinates around. Uh, anyway, so that's my little pitch for that. Uh, but I think okay. that I think that we should focus on uh, data structures rather than uh, C implementations of SQ. Okay, um, we run out of time. <laughs> we need to pass to the next one. So I thank you again for this really provoking <laughs> presentation. It's it's really nice. It makes us think and and try to come up with with new stuff, with better stuff. So. This is this is good for all of us. And um, so thank you again. And I call the audience for a virtual applause if you enjoy this presentation. Thanks, Vera. There are <laughs> thanks to you. Yeah. There are a couple of more questions that I will paste into the chat. So if you want, you can answer there. Okay.